Kelly Gerling, and many of you, if not most of you, know Kelly, but I bet there's quite a bit you don't know about him. And so I want to share a little bit from his bio. Uh, Kelly is a mediator, coach, therapist, author, and educator. He has a Bachelor of Science degree in Environmental Resources, a Master of Arts in Human Relations and General Counseling, and he received his PhD in Clinical Psychology. He works with clients applying the latest advances of cognitive science, psychology, NLP, and other emerging fields. He is co-author of the book, NLP, The New Technology of Achievement, and is a contributing author to a book on alternative education titled Creating Learning Communities. Kelly has over three decades of experience as a mediator. He was certified in the state of Kansas as an approved mediator in core and domestic mediation and continues his mediation work here in Washington and around the country. Kelly's mission as a coach is to help his clients dream huge dreams, translate them into achievable visions, and support them in developing the strategies to transform those visions into reality. Please join me with a warm welcome for Kelly. And we'll get to hear more from him in a few minutes. How about that? One more round of applause. <laughs> yes, let us wake up now. In 1993, I did something I've done a lot since. I called up a person I wanted to learn from. I called up Apollo 9 astronaut Russell Swikert. I was 30 years old and <clears throat> I wanted to interview him about something and he was nice enough, he answered the phone, he agreed to do a recording. And I've since reviewed what I wrote about that <clears throat> in a book where I quoted him and I've reviewed the interview, and I wanted to share with you this idea that he shared with me, which is one of those ideas. It's a, it's a world-saving, earth-healing, extraordinary insight into what we need to do, collectively, humanity. And everything that I'm gonna talk about in, this, in my sermon, 15 or 20 minutes, no more, Diane, you just let me know if I'm going over, uh, is leading up to that idea that I want to share is something for all of us to ponder and think about and decide uh, whether we want to embrace that idea. So um, more on that later. 48 years ago, the first Earth Day occurred. Now, if you're over 50, you have a chance of remembering that. If you're under 50, you'll have to take our word for it. We had an Earth Day in 1970. That was the same year I had a chance to circumnavigate the entire world with my dad, who was an airline pilot. And I took 10 flights from Kansas City to Kansas City the long way around. New York, Athens, Bombay, Bangkok, and so forth, Hong Kong. Okinawa, Guam, Honolulu, LA, back to Kansas City. And I, and I was in the cockpit a lot. That was in the old days, where you, if, you're, if you're the pilot's kid, you get to sit up there and play in the cockpit and hang out. So it was a wonderful experience to see our world, uh, the whole world, at least the Northern Hemisphere, you know, to, to, to get a sense of the Earth uh, as a teenager, you know, in all these different places, which I was totally changed forever to see Bombay, for example. And I understood what poverty was about. In Kansas, we didn't have shanty towns of hundreds of thousands of people. So it was a huge eye opener. And, uh, and so that first Earth Day in 1970, invented by a gentleman named John McConnell, is a way of reminding us, kind of like a a wedding anniversary, if the earth is our mom uh, or our wife, we want, to, we want to have an anniversary to remember. It's like a birthday. And so Earth Day is a way we can remember Mother Earth, or we can call her Earth, or we can call her Mother Nature, 
or we can call her Gaia or the Earth system, all the same, is the Earth is all around us. The Earth produces the air we are breathing. Try not breathing it for a minute or two and you'll appreciate, like when you're swimming underwater or holding your breath. So uh, it's extraordinary that we have an Earth Day, that we've had 48 of them. And what I'm gonna do under the topic of healing Mother Earth is a kind of medical approach, diagnosis, treatment plan, figure out how to do the treatment so that we can heal her and us as part of her. And to do that, I'm gonna invoke a couple of unity principles. So principle three, uh, the power of thought to create. Principle five, action, live what we know, what we learn, what we think. Those two, thought and action. And it's like Karen said in a sermon a couple weeks ago, intention and commitment add up to or equal faith that, that you create these, these experiences and concepts that lead to, some, lead to something new, something else. And we need faith in order to not experience despair particularly in light of problems with the earth. Cynicism is the psychological defense, a self-fulfilling psychological defense, of weakness to power. The last song we heard invited us to wake up. I need to move. And so we all need to move. And so an example of this, these two principles of thought, new thought, sometimes innovative thought, and action occurred in the 1980s when I read a newspaper article about a story. And, and at that time, some of you'll remember that the fear of a nuclear war was just enormous, so much so, so enormous, this fear, that a majority of children, when asked, do you think you're gonna grow up to be an adult? They said, no. They didn't think so because of the threat of nuclear war. Uh, there was a movie called uh, The Day After, 1984, ABC movie. Uh, it, this fear was so great, my, I volunteered you know, to go up to my old high school and talk to the social studies kids. I talked to 450 kids in groups of 90, uh, all the social studies classes, just helping them process the, the movie was focused on Kansas City. I was in Kansas City, so <laughs> it was a little personal, the nuclear war that was shown on television that everybody watched. And they processed it. They thought about it. I just had a, I, I let them express themselves and, and ask them, you know, what, what they could do. Um, and so that was the context. And so there was a teacher, I think it was Minnesota, and uh, this teacher asked her kids, like, 12, 13 year olds. The polls say a lot of people are afraid they're not going to grow up. Or do you think you're going to grow up? They all agreed, no, they didn't think they're going to grow up. They thought the world was going to be blown up before then, except one little girl. And so naturally, the teacher said, so why, why do you think you're going to grow up? What's the deal? You're the odd one here. And she said, well, my parents are always going to meetings to stop war and to create peace, and so I think if they're going to meetings and doing something about it, everything's going to be fine. So not only does action inspire ourselves out of cynicism, but it inspires others. It inspires children to do something, like the song said to lift others up, like Paul said in his wonderful presentation. And so what I would like to do is, in the rest of this talk, I'm gonna to get to that idea that I got from Rusty Swikert and share with, with you some other people who've expressed the same idea. But before that, and I'm gonna lead up to that with 
a medical approach to healing the earth. So there's the diagnosis, treatment plan, implement the treatment. And so I'm going to talk about those things relative to Mother Earth. The, um, a really cool way to understand who we're treating comes from a quotation I'd like to offer from Jim Lovelock. Who's heard of Jim Lovelock, James Lovelock? James Lovelock, thanks Vic, uh, James Lovelock invented, along with a novelist he talked with, William Golding, the concept of the Gaia hypothesis, which in modern times has evolved into the Gaia theory. In the Gaia theory, Gaia, word for Mother Earth, from Greek, I believe, is a scientific way to look at the system of the Earth in which we live, on whom we are dependent. She is all around us. She gave birth to us. If there's a scientific miracle, <laughs> she's it. 46 million centuries ago, 4.6 billion years, a star blew up. It went supernova. It created <clears throat> what's called a nebula, a big, huge cloud. If you look at the Orion, and you see there's the Orion Nebula, that's a nebula, and we were a nebula. And it coalesced into a new star and a bunch of dust and rock and stuff. And then that turned into nine or 10 planets, depending on who's counting, maybe eight. What is it this week? So we have a star and we have planets, and on the third planet, us, a planet which is unique in many ways. I wanna to go to, straight to diagnosis. Now, fortunately, oh, I want to go to, let me read Jim, Lovelock. And here's his quote for Gaia. One role we play is as the senses and nervous system for Gaia. Through our eyes, she has for the first time seen her very fair face. That's the astronauts. That's the cameras outside of the Earth. And in our minds, become aware of herself. Gaia and universe has become aware of herself through us, each of us. The Earth is a living system, and we are part of it. That's the essence of Gaia. So what is the diagnosis? Well, <clears throat> I'm just one person. I am utterly unqualified, even with a little degree in environmental science, to consider my opinion as authoritative. It isn't. However, I have enough of a framework about environmental science to know how to find the authoritative opinions from what amounts to a de facto group of medical specialists who are diagnosing Gaia for us, Mother Earth for us, in terms of the problems that we've all heard about. And I'd like you to bear with me in, in, in just a few minutes. I'm going to read <clears throat> the opinions, the conclusions of the diagnosis of the Earth system. And I, and I want to warn you a good summary would be the odds are against us and the situation is dire. Now, does this seem out of line or exaggerated? How many, how many people think maybe the situation is dire? <laughs> At least I know I'm not crazy. <laughs> so, in 1992, 1,700 scientists plus signed a warning to humanity. This included a majority of science Nobel laureates. So it's a smart group, much smarter than me or any one person. And here was their conclusion. A great change in our stewardship of the earth and the life on it 
is required, a great change, if vast human misery is to be avoided. And that's the end of my, no. We've got we've to go beyond. We've got to do what the songs say. So 25 years later, 20,000 scientists signed a follow-up, including me. I got to sign this one. And, and there's just a few sentences. So this is the follow-up to the first one last year. Humanity has failed to make sufficient progress in generally solving these foreseen environmental challenges and alarming them, alarmingly most of them are getting far worse. Especially troubling is the current trajectory of potential, potentially catastrophic climate change due to rising greenhouse gases from burning fossil fuels, deforestation and agricultural production, particularly from meat animals. Moreover, we have unleashed a mass extinction event, the sixth in roughly 540 million years, wherein many current life forms could be annihilated or at least committed to extinction by the end of the century. It, it, the conclusion is soon it will be too late to shift course away from our failing trajectory and time is running out. We must recognize in our day-to-day -day lives and in our governing institutions that Earth, with all, with all its life, is our only home. That's the 25-year follow-up. The corroborating diagnosis is from the Global Environment Outlook report, the fifth one. This is something that came. I have some props from the 1987 Common Security, a blueprint for survival book, which was endorsed by the UN. And they followed up every five years. And here is the latest Geo 5. Geo 6 is due out 2019. Have to see what they say as human pressures on the Earth system accelerate. This one's in your uh, flyer. Several criti critical global, regional, and local thresholds are close or have been exceeded. Once these have been passed, abrupt and possibly irreversible changes to the life support functions of the planet are likely to occur with significant adverse implications for human well-being. Same story. And then there's the doomsday clock was just moved to two minutes to midnight due to the twin threats. Rachel Bronson writing for the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists with the doomsday clock said, in 2017, world leaders failed to respond effectively to the looming threats of nuclear war and climate change, making the world security situation more dangerous than it was a year ago and as dangerous as it has been since World War II. And it goes on. So, there are more. I could find a do there's a dozen, two dozen, going all the way back to 1955 and the Bertrand Russell, Albert Einstein warning, same type of thing back then about nuclear weapons. And so, uh, that's the diagnosis. The odds are against us. The situation is dire. So what is the treatment plan? What do we do? Because, you know, who wants to be cynical? What's fun about that? I've come up with a, a formula to give me hope. The existential global crisis needs a certain response, an exponential form of innovation across multiple domains. So an existential crisis requires an exponential response. That means a lot of people working together. What's that about? Has that happened before? Well, I looked up the World War II mobilization. So the Germans attacked in Europe in 1939. By 1940, we were the Americans were thinking we're probably going to have to go into that war, so they started transforming the economy. From 1940 through the middle of 43, they got to the point where there were no, no one wasn't working. There was a labor shortage. 
They couldn't employ everyone. The entire economy shifted. For example, the auto industry shifted to become a tank industry and an aircraft industry. And so it is with the entire economy in four years was completely transformed in order to deal with the crisis that is let's win, not lose World War II. And that's the kind of mobilization we need, except we don't, it, it, it can't be just four years or five years, it needs to be 40 years or 50 years at least, and then we'll see where we are by 2050 or 2060. And, it, but it hasn't happened. So, you know, why hasn't it happened? What's it gonna take? Um, treatment plan. What does it mean to have innovation in multiple domains? Well, you know, I know about a few. No one person knows about all of them. So I know a lot about foreign policy. So the big, the big shift there would be from a global war on terror to the global rule of law, which would be a total shift uh, akin to the mobilization in World War II. Economics, uh, what would be the shift from funneling money to a tiny number of rich people any way they can to an economy that is designed to benefit the many, not just the few, for the common good. So again, it's that kind of innovation that would occur that current institutions here anyway in our country haven't been able to achieve uh, in a while. There was a lot, some of that during the New Deal, but that's vanished over the last few decades since the mid 70s. So those are a few examples. We need it in technology. We need it in education. We need it in transportation. We need it in manufacturing. We need it in political design or constitutional design. We need it in all kinds of areas. And, and that's anything short of that is, is gonna be uh, not enough. And so, what then? Well, I wanna give one example of what's possible, energy. I don't know, how many people have heard about the Stanford energy, renewable energy scenarios? There's a gentleman by the name of Mark Z. Jacobson, and I just contacted him two days ago, sent an email, he wrote back, we had this nice dialogue. You know, he and his team at Stanford, again, 150 peer-reviewed papers have concluded and created scenarios for total shifts to renewable energy in 139 countries, 50% by 2030, 100% and zero carbon in 139 countries by 2050. And he's documented how that's possible. So I asked him in an email two days ago, I said, I'm gonna give a talk, Mark need to know what prevents your scenarios from happening. And he said, the lack of understanding that they're possible. One, two, political will is lacking, so we need political will to do these things, like the World War II mobilization had political will, and a new concept, social will, he, new to me. He said, we need social will where everyone feels like they're participating. You know, well, I, my grandmother was involved in World War II and my dad, and he went to war. My dad did. My grandmother had a degree in math, so she tested airplane engines like she did in World War I. Uh, and so everybody got involved. And it's that, that's the social will. A treatment plan has to include a way to create political will, a way to create social will, a way to create mass understanding of the possibilities that are before us. Now it hasn't happened in the 48 years since Earth Day. Not enough, even Germany that has the best, Germany, Sweden, Finland, they have the best renewable energy plans and things in operation. And their, their per capita emissions are still going up. And, and so it just hasn't been enough. And, and so what's that idea, that key idea I started with? My interview with Rusty Swikert. This is an idea which is just extraordinary. There are fundamental limitations in our institutions serving the needs of the whole planet because the institutions themselves serve best the things that are below them in scale and worst, 
the things above them in scale. Basically, institutions, whether governments or corporations, are somewhat limited intellectually, and the only way they are going to change is for individuals to express themselves individually or collectively to change those institutions. Now, it's not just Rusty. At the women's movement, a, a woman named Janelle Monet said this, I thought it was just significant. We birthed this nation and we can unbirth this nation if we choose. Now I'm not sure if she was referring to the women who all gave babies to who all we are, uh, or had babies, or whether she's referring to the people creating a, a government with the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and then the next Constitution. But in any case, there's an empowerment there. Here's Danny Glover's statement in 2011 to Occupy Oakland. This is very explicit. We have to be here, not only to change it, but to ensure that this transformation, he's talking about economic equality probably, is institutionalized. We have to ensure that this transformation is institutionalized just as the transformations into a country controlled by corporations have been institutionalized. So the task before us as individuals is to answer the question, how do we assess our powers? How do we marshal our capacity, not only to do things individually in our own lives that are good, that are kind, that are compassionate, that involve change, but also how do we change the institutions that matter? Nations, states, companies, laws, certainly the UN Charter, probably the American Constitution. How do we change these things so they become better expressions of the popular will? The Jacobson story that I mentioned about renewable energy, he sent me a survey. 80% of the American people want renewables if possible rather than burning fossil fuel, 80%. So what is the image? Picture, you can go from Seattle anywhere pollution free in a, an electric aircraft from renewable electricity or a bullet train is probably more likely. And everybody in the world can do that. And so that is the crucial vision just for energy but probably for everything. The poet, musician, Gil Scott Heron in 1982 said, the first revolution is when you change your mind about how you look at things and see that there might be another way to look at it that you have not been shown. Well, what the, the Danny Glover, Rusty, Rusty Swikert, Janelle Monet are all saying is change has to include changing the institutions that are driving the bus. And if we don't change those institutions, 50 years from now, humanity will be worse. We can't, it's not, none of it's predictable at this point. It's too complex. So what I'd like to do is, is close with a way of dealing with the diagnosis, because the diagnosis is a tough one, and it affects everyone and it affects the children and the grandchildren. And so, uh, how many people saw the Star Trek film, Generations, it's the movie. So in that film, Picard meets Kirk for the first time due to an odd circumstance. And in this, there was this great threat to a planet and Picard's trying to enlist Kirk's help. And he says, to Kirk, you know, I really need your help, it's important. And Kirk says, 
don't tell me. The odds are against us. And the situation is dire. And Picard says, yeah, that's true. And Kirk says, sounds like fun. <laughs> and that is the way to deal with that diagnosis is let's do what the mother did for her daughter and the mother and father and inspire them. Let's get to work. A uh, meditation. I'd like to do a meditation to wrap up th some of these ideas for you, for all of us, for me too. So get yourself in a comfortable position for just a few minutes, a couple minutes. And let the quote that we've all heard from John Anster on boldness reverberate and echo in your mind and heart and soul. Are you in earnest? Seize this very minute. What you can do or dream, you can begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. And let yourself ponder a couple of questions and let the questions guide you to your own discovery and whatever call you may be receiving from the inside. What are my powers or superpowers, such as special skills and deep knowledge, contacts and memberships in my network, my privileges and my wealth, or other powers? What are they? Take an inventory. These are your means of change. And then ask, how can I use these powers that I possess to bring about large-scale institutional support in whatever way I can, in whatever institutions I am blessed to have a chance to influence to support healing for our planet by joining with others in unity and in solidarity. For the children, the grandchildren, and the generations of tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>